All right, Faith Church family, uh, think about all the human experiences out there and think about the ones that engender or stimulate humans to write songs. I can think of no other human experience that has written such um, songs of hope like the encounter with the risen Savior that we've been singing about this morning. The closest thing that comes to the kinds of songs that Christianity has is the songs written between humans about love, but this is the greatest love story of all time, singing about our God's love for us in Jesus Christ. And that's why we have these kinds of songs to sing about on Easter Resurrection Sunday morning. Thank you, worship team, for uh, leading us in those kinds of songs. Well, Faith Church family, he is risen. And you say? He is risen, he is risen indeed. Joseph Bailey was a Christian American author. He and his wife together gave life to seven children. Over the course of Joe Bailey's life, he experienced the death of not one, not two, but three of his seven children. Joe Bailey had the, and I don't wish this on any parent, he had the horrif horrifying experience of looking upon the corpses of three of his dear children. In his book called, this is a powerful title, The View from a Hearse, he wrote this, death destroys beauty and violent death creates obscenity, tasteless, horrid, raw. We as a society, we as humans, we can't beautify death You've never looked at a funeral at a corpse and said, I want to look like that. You have never, ever done that. A corpse is never beautiful, no, ma no matter how much you try to make it so. Not surprising, the scripture says in Job 18, 14, that death is the king of terrors. In Psalm 55, 4, David, as he's facing death, says, the terrors of death have fallen upon me. French author Francois de la Rochefoucauld said this, death like the sun cannot be looked at steadily. We have problems looking in the face of death, just like we have problems looking at the sun and staring at it. And why can't we look at death and stare at it without, terror, without turning away? And I think we all know the answer to that, but we can give words to that question as we consider Shakespeare's Hamlet, when he was considering suicide, he said he would not because of this. Here are his words as Shakespeare wrote, the dread of something after death, the, unders the undiscovered country from which no traveler returns. It puzzles the will and makes us rather bear the ills that we have now rather than fly to others that we know not of. Death makes cowards of us all, and there it is, the dread of something after death, making cowards of us all now. We might also wish that the German philosopher Martin Heidegger's statement was not true when he said, death is something which no one can do for us. And oh, we wish that there could be somebody who would take it for us. Death is that one terrifying certainty that produces in every human without exception, without exception, a deep spiritual anxiety. And that is biblical according to Hebrews chapter 2, verse 15, who all of humans enslaved to fear all of their lives. Ernest Becker in his Pulitzer Prize winning book recognizes this human condition and his book is called The Denial of Death. He confirms this biblical claim. When he says this, the ideal of death, the fear of it, haunts the human animal like nothing else. It is a mainspring of human activity. It means it drives you. Um, it's designed largely to avoid the fatality of death, to overcome it by denying it in some way that it is the final destiny of man. This spiritual anxiety, whether conscious or just always simmering below the surface, it informs our day-to-day -day existence in a couple of different ways. We may deny the reality of death by living this present life as if this life is all that there is. We accumulate wealth and success and fame, and we engage in 
self-preservation and self-enjoyment at all costs. And this, my life for me now, my enjoyment now, must then come at the expense of, well, others. So this way of life is an evil way of life. Secondly, we may respond to death by attempting to try to appease some kind of deity in the afterlife. We become super focused on our own religiosity in the hope that something or someone in the afterlife will be happy with me. And this approach also occurs at the expense of others. As I live my life in constant comparison to you, to hope to be better than you, to secure my place somewhere in the afterlife. (laughs) Ernest Becker again, and I don't believe he was a Christian, but he concludes about mankind and its concept of death that literally man drives himself into blind obliviousness with social games, psychological tricks, personal preoccupations, so far removed from reality of his situation that they are forms of madness, agreed madness, shared madness, disguised madness, and dignified madness, but madness all of the same. But there will come a time when the awareness of death dawns that has been blotted out by all of our frenetic activity, and the fear of death emerges in its pure essence. You know, friends, uh, part of the dynamic of any anxiety is not to face the reality there. Those of you who are worriers, and uh, I, I count myself as one of those, those who are worriers and tend to struggle with fear, you know that many times we just don't face reality. So friends, on this Easter morning, On this resurrection celebration morning, let's together deal with the spiritual anxiety of death facing it this morning head on. Today we are talking about Jesus, our resurrected Savior. He is risen. Yeah, let's try that one more time. He is risen. (laughs) All right. Turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 28. That is on page 25 in the New Testament, in the back section of the Bible, in the chair in front of you. As I read this account, and I'm going to read it without explanation. Normally, when I read Scripture to you, I I insert my own explanations, and I'm not doing that this time. I'm going to tell you why. As you read Matthew, please notice, there is no theologizing here. Matthew will not theologize here. Matthew will not apply the facts here. He will have no explanatory quotations about the resurrection. He won't quote the Old Testament. You can look back one chapter, and he's quoting some things there in, the, in chapter 27 from the Old Testament, but he doesn't do it here. Ask yourself why. On this Easter morning, faith, family, this account is the Word of God for us. Verse 1, now after the Sabbath... As it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to look at the grave. And behold, a severe earthquake had occurred, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven, came and rolled away the stone and sat upon it. And his appearance was like lightning and his clothing as white as snow. The guards shook for fear of him and became like dead men. The angel said to the women, do not be afraid, for I know that you're looking for Jesus who has been crucified. He is not here. He is risen, just as he said. Come see the place where he was lying. Go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And behold, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Behold, I have told you. And they left the tomb quickly with fear and great joy and ran to report it to his disciples. And behold, Jesus met them and greeted them. And they came up and looked and took hold of his feet and worshiped him. And then Jesus said to them, do not be afraid. Go and take word to my brethren to leave for Galilee, and there they will see me. And now when they were on their way, some of the guards came into the city and reported to the chief priests all that had happened. And when they had assembled with the elders and consulted together, they gave them a large sum of money to the soldiers and said, here you are, you are to say... His disciples came by night and stole him away while we were asleep. And if this should come to the governor's ears, we will win him over and keep you out of trouble. 
And they took the money and did as they had been instructed. And this story was widely spread among the Jews as it is to this day. But the 11 disciples proceeded to Galilee, to the mountain which Jesus had designated. And when they saw him, they worshiped him. But, but some were doubtful. And Jesus came up and spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Faith Church family, on this resurrection celebration morning, let's develop this, the reactions that everyone Everyone must take to transform the soul-corroding spiritual anxiety of death. Oh, friends, it permeates us into fearless living now and fearlessness regarding the undiscovered country that awaits after death. In regard to that anxiety of death, first action, intentionally engage intentionally engaged with the evidence of the resurrection. I hope you noticed, because I prepped you for this, Matthew offered no explanation, no theologizing, no application of the resurrection. He didn't. N.T. Right? Wright said, if all we had was the stories of Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection, we would never know that anyone ever interpreted the resurrection narratives as providing a basis for future hope for us. There is no theologizing. There is no application in this account. This straightforward approach without interpretation, what does that tell us? What does that tell us? Well, perhaps you've had the, the opportunity to participate in a police report or an investigation or the giving of information regarding some kind of an account that people are asking about. And what do the investigators want? What do they want? They want the facts. The more opinion you throw in there into your report, the more, more likely that that report will be viewed as highly biased. So what does Matthew's uninterpreted report tell us regarding what we have here? And what we have here most likely are early circulated oral accounts of eyewitness testimony. Now, if Matthew's presentation of Jesus from chapter 1 to chapter 27, up to this point, has been like an orchestra, playing all of its instruments, highlighting and explaining the life and the ministry of Jesus, then the resurrection account here in the last chapter is like all of the instruments dropping out and a lone flute carrying the melody that screams, listen to what I am playing. And this is how Matthew ends. One lone instrument playing one melody, the evidence for Jesus' resurrection. Everything previously prevent, presented about his identity, his ministry, his work on the cross comes into hearing clarity right now and ask this question, how will you respond to this melody? If this report of the resurrection with its unvarnished account is not true, if it's not true, Go ahead, write everything else off from Matthew chapter 1 through 27. Write it all off if this is not true. Oh, friends, but if it, if it is true, if it is true, everything about this Jesus' identity, everything about his ministry from chapters 1 through 27, everything about his work, if it is true, you cannot ignore it. So let's not ignore this morning the three pieces of evidence that Matthew offers. The first one is this. Oh, friends, there was, there was an empty tomb. Tell me this. Tell me this. What is the first thing to do to prove that somebody is dead? What is the first thing to do to prove that somebody is dead? Bring out the corpse. <laughs> Bring, produce the corpse. Exhume the grave. Put the corpse on display. 
So two women came to the tomb. They encountered the unexpected sight of an angel with the stone, co- with the stone covering of the tomb having been removed. And the angel said, look inside. Produce the corpse. There is no corpse. Furthermore, all of the gospel accounts indicate that the first witnesses were women. Okay? The first witnesses of the empty tomb, no corpse, were women. Friends, this is not insignificant. I know today it might be, oh, it doesn't matter today, but in that time it was not insignificant. Why? It certainly doesn't take long as you read through the New Testament to discern that the culture at that time, I'm not saying this is right, okay? I'm not saying this is right, and Jesus didn't say it was right. The apostles didn't say it was right. But the culture at that time was prejudiced against women. That's not surprising. hundred years ago in our own culture, only then were women given the right to vote. So this is not surprising in human history. Okay? Women were not viewed as trustworthy witnesses. Second century critic of Christianity, Celsius, said that women, the women witnesses at the tomb were hysterical women. <laughs> hysterical women. Deluded by Jesus' sorcery, so wrenched with grief at his failure that they hallucinated him rising from the dead by a sort of wishful thinking. Wow, the problem with the world is hysterical women. I didn't say that. He said it. (laughs) What an amazing thing. Those who dismiss this account because they say women are not reliable witnesses are missing something terribly, terribly obvious. Think about this. If Jesus' disciples were making up this story, if it was a made-up story 20, 30 years after the resurrection, why would anybody have chosen unreliable witnesses? Why wouldn't they have picked some upstanding citizen to be the first person to view the... uh, empty tomb. Why were the women the first witnesses? Because that is what really happened. Theologically, I believe there's significance to this. I believe God allowed women to be the first witnesses to exalt those who were culturally marginalized. And also, Who was the first person in human history to be deceived? Say her name, Eve. Now the first to receive truth are the women. Friends, will you engage with the evidence of the empty tomb? Secondly, the second piece of evidence, which you cannot ignore this, a group of his followers along with many others believe they saw him living and touched him, okay? How do you verify a historical claim? How do you verify it? Well, on April 10th, 1979, in southwest Oklahoma, a line of severe thunderstorms spawned several tornadoes. Today, 45 years later, how would you ever prove that? Are there still people from southwest Oklahoma living today who saw that and experienced that? I'm one. I'm one. I remember as a 10-year-old when the tornado sirens blared, and this was one of the things I had nightmares about growing up in Oklahoma, tornadoes. And every spring, um, fearing what would happen, but the tornado sirens blared, and I went out on the back porch and looked west. And for the first and only time in my life, I saw a tornado. And me and my family ran to our neighbor's cellar at that point. And even today, even today, if you ask people today, did something happen back then? Yes, I was there. Many could tell you about what is now called Terrible Tuesday in southwest Oklahoma. The Apostle Paul, writing to the Corinthians, mentions 500 people that saw Jesus. And Paul said of those witnesses, most of whom remain till this day of his writing. Here's the point. Verifying the report about a man Jesus being seen after his reported death 
What did it require? It only required individuals to go and talk to the witnesses that were still living at that point in time. Oh, friends, in this Easter resurrection celebration morning, I'm asking you to engage the evidence, face it directly head on. And the third piece of evidence is those who believed, I should put who believed if you're taking notes, the word who, those who believed, they saw him carried out his mission, even if it meant their potential death. You know, from this point on, Jesus' followers were radically and suddenly changed. They carried forth the great commission that we read at the end of Matthew. For what earthly gain did they do this? I know what it was. Apparently, it was the wealth that they would receive from being a TV evangelist. I'm sure that was it. It was the fame that they would receive from being a megachurch pastor. I know that was it. It was probably the acceptance that they would engender from preaching a wildly popular message about sin. <laughs> I'm sure that was it as they preached their messages to a fawning crowd. No, those weren't it. Many of his followers who had been suddenly and radically changed had, were mocked for what they were saying, were ridiculed, were tortured, and eventually they were murdered. Please tell me, who lives like this for a lie and dies like they did for a lie. Furthermore, 30 years after the resurrection, Christianity had so rapidly spread, so much from its origin in Jerusalem, that the emperor Nero would blame the vast, the vast number of Christians in Rome for some of its troubles that were happening there in Rome. Oh, friends, engage the evidence. The unvarnished accounts gives us the evidence. And we in our world tend to believe all kinds of things on much less evidence. Principles of evolutionary biology. Now, this is not a lecture on creation versus evolution, but we tend to believe a lot, a lot more on a lot less evidence. Principles of clinical psychology, some principles of cosmology, or many principles of historical geology. Engage the evidence. What is the best explanation for the evidence presented here? The empty tomb, those who saw him, and the radical and sudden change of his disciples unto death. What is the best explanation? Jesus is risen. <laughs> he is risen, and you say? He is risen indeed. Secondly, as we engage the evidence, we have to resist our innate tendency to deny reality. You know, the American Psychological Association defines denial, a defense mechanism in which unpleasant thoughts, feelings, wishes, or events are ignored or excluded from conscious awareness. You know, Matthew's narrative includes an account of the guards and the chief priests responding to the same evidence that you were presented as well. Right? And they all went into the extensive denial mode. They handsomely paid the guards to tell this lie. The disciples came by night when we were asleep, and they stole the body. <laughs> Can you spot a gaping hole in that story? Can you spot a gaping hole in that story? Maybe you can. Let me help you. If the guards were asleep, if the guards were asleep, how do they know what happened? Our denials of reality make us irrational and deepen the holes that we dig, that we stick our heads in. One of the modern efforts to explain away the resurrection is that the ancient society was inclined to believe the superstitious and supernatural. In essence, <laughs> we're so modern and sophisticated that uh, they were just gullible back then, and they believed all of this kind of stuff. Totally fair question. Okay. Were the disciples in the ancient culture gullible? <laughs> Another question. Were the disciples wishing 
Were the disciples believing? Were the disciples hoping or waiting by the grave on the third day? Were they waiting and hoping and believing on the third day? Were they? Were they? No. In fact, earlier when Christ stated plainly to the disciples, guys, I'm going to Jerusalem and I'm dying, and then I'm going to rise again on the third day. Do you remember what Peter said? What did Peter say? It may never be, Lord. Okay. Second example. Remember Martha in John chapter 11? Um, her brother died. Her brother Lazarus died, and Jesus says directly, your brother will rise again. And Martha says, Jesus, I know. In the last day, you know, far from now, I know he'll rise again, but not now. Then Jesus raises him from the dead. It's just not true. It's not true that the ancients were more superstitious or gullible or prone to the supernatural than we moderns are today. It's not true. And for us to believe that we are more sophisticated than them is in C.S. Lewis's words, chronological snobbery. We think we're better than them. You know, 20 years from now, 30 years from now, your grandchildren are going to be thinking about what you did was like stupid. <laughs> your lifestyle was stupid. This is the natural thing of the way that we grow older. And we look back and say, um, um, they were way back then pretty gullible. You know, the, the text even says they had the same struggles, even some doubted after all of the evidence. Our denial of reality tend, seems to be hardwired into us. Even psychologist Sigmund Freud built part of his psychological system on suppression of reality. We instinctively, naturally, and often, often intentionally filter out reality that we just don't want to think about. At the Good Friday service, I mentioned a comment from Aldous Huxley, a non-Christian English philosopher, who said, and I'm paraphrasing, I had motives for not wanting the world to have an objective, God-oriented, meaningful, moral reality. Me and my peers wanted liberation. We objected to the morality because it interfered with our sexual freedom. Because I want certain things, I filter out real things. Is this not exactly what the Apostle Paul would say that all of us do? We suppress the truth in unrighteousness. So if anything, like all of us, the disciples were hardwired against believing in certain difficult realities, including the resurrection. And it took an enormous amount of physical evidence to change their minds and subsequently their lives. Today, friends, on Resurrection Sunday, what are you denying? The reality that we are all mortal and we will die. The reality that this life is not all that there is. There is a life after this, the undiscovered country the reality of sin, the reality of you not being able to atone for your own sin, and somehow the reality of this man named Jesus who apparently God raised from the dead. You know, friends, when Joseph Bailey said, death cannot be beautified, or Rochefoucauld said, death like the sun cannot be looked at steadily, they were right. Unless, unless, unless the reality of death has been eclipsed and somehow beautified. Folks, engage the evidence, resist the temptation to deny. And third, let's have our gaze transfixed and stare at that more beautiful reality. Number three, embrace the meaning and the mission of the resurrection you know, we know the end of Matthew chapter 28 is the Great Commission, where we get our marching orders, where we get our purpose. And although Matthew, as I mentioned, has not explained and theologized about the meaning of the resurrection, in fact, each part of this Great Commission that Jesus is reported to have given here is implicitly laden with meaning of Jesus' resurrection. So the Great Commission, this passage that is dear to us, the Great Commission regarding the living Jesus, 
signifies this. Oh, friends, God has conquered the reign of death. You know, at the end, Jesus says to his disciples, go back to the mountain in Galilee, and I'm going to meet you there. I know sometimes we just look over that a mountain. Okay, mountain, go back. And we don't think about geography. We don't. Um, but throughout Matthew, mountains have been a big part of Jesus' story with his disciples. Where did he do a, his famous sermon? Sermon on the what? Sermon on the what? Sermon on the Mount. When did Christ's divine glory shine through? The Mount of what? Mount of Transfiguration. On which occasion Jesus also said to his disciples this, tell no one until after I rise from the dead what you've seen. From where would Jesus come into Jerusalem? He came from uh, the Mount of what? Olives. And in his Olivet Discourse, he says he's going to return on that mountain as well. So not only in Matthew, but throughout redemptive history, mountains have been an important part of the redemptive story. In the beginning of the Garden of Eden, the Garden of Delight, Eden means delight, is referred to as the mountain of God where Adam and Eve dwelled with God. So now, post-resurrection, where does Jesus tell his disciples to go to meet him? Go to Galilee on the mountain. It is entirely possible that Jesus' post-resurrection meeting with his disciples was on the mountain of transfiguration. I can't prove this for sure. But if so, and even if not exactly so, you still get a picture. What picture do you have? The resurrected divine God-man Jesus dwelling with his people on the mountain. And tell me, what does that hearken back to? The Garden of Eden, where mankind dwelled with God on the mountain of God. And regardless of if all of these mountain connections are valid or not, the point is still God has made a way back to him for life. The kingdom of God and all that it represents has overcome the kingdom of death. Oh, death, where is your sting? The undiscovered country is now discovered. It's Eden 2.0 with Christ. There doesn't have to be fear of what happens after death. He is risen, and you say. <laughs> Secondly, the Great Commission passion, passion, passage, telling from the living Jesus, signifies this. There is only one man, only one man in history who has been vindicated by God. <laughs> and I know you're happy about this. There will never, ever be another sons of geology that you have to read in the scripture. <laughs> All authority has been given unto me, according to Jesus. I know one of the reasons that you love the New Testament compared to the Old Testament is that you never have to wade hardly through another endless geology again. Matthew started his gospel with a genealogy. And guess what? When Jesus comes, that's the end of genealogies. And you say, so what? <laughs> Did Jesus just end this so that I don't have to read geal genealogies anymore? No, no, no. It means so much more than that. Here is the so what. God the Father has found the obedient Adam, the unfaltering Abraham, the non-deceiving Jacob, the true suffering servant Joseph, the non-stuttering and no sinful anger Moses, the faithful Israel, and the non-adulterous King David. The search for the man who would bring forth righteousness has been found in Jesus of Nazareth. And although during his life, the people at that time accused Jesus of being a drunkard, demon-possessed, a sinner, a common criminal, and a blasphemer. And at his death, his own disciples, intending to go back to their previous occupations, were probably thinking, apparently just Jesus, whom I followed for these last three years, was just another failed Messiah. All these claims that he made out about himself to be God in the flesh come down from heaven, to be the Son of God, to be the figure that Daniel prophesied about, the Son of Man, to have authority to forgive, to have the authority to judge. Was all this just musings of a lunatic? 
Were the crowds right? Did his death prove that he failed? What, friends, today, what, friends, justifies anybody believing what Jesus Christ said about himself and that his death was not a spectacular evidence of his lunacy and his mass deception of people? What justifies us believing that this is true? What justifies it? He is risen. And you say, God raising him from the dead was vindication regarding all of these claims. So friends, let your gaze stare here and consider this. The only choice you have now is what you will do with the one who has, has all authority. If you will, please say all. Say all. And one who is living, the one who is the living one. He's not dead. A dead man has no authority over anybody. But the living one who has all authority, who you will meet someday because he's living. What are you going to do with him? Now, will you come to him and recognize him as the one with all authority, including over you? Or will you go on denying that there is a living human being that has authority over you? Jesus says this, I say to you, my friends, and the resurrection vindicated this. I say to you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who can kill the body and after that have no more that they can do. But I will warn you whom to fear. Fear the one after he is killed. The body has authority to cast into hell. Yes, fear him. Friends, am I trying to scare you today? Am I trying to scare you on Easter? In some ways, yes. I'm asking you to face, face the reality of death that we have so much of a problem staring into, but I'm asking you to stare right into it this day. Stare at it. Stare at it. Because then we can begin to deal with the reality. And the Great Commission passage also signifies this. A new mankind is possible. Go and make disciples, Jesus Christ says. So the one who has all authority has the authority to make something new out of you. The one who has all this authority is making a new mankind through forgiveness of sins through repentance. When the Great Commission says baptizing them, that means coming to him in repentance and faith. Friends, why is forgiveness of sins possible now? And here's why. Because God has turned Rochefoucauld statement, not being able to stare at death, or Martin Heidegger's statement, death is something which nobody can do for another, or Joseph Bailey's statement about not being able to beautify death. God has turned all of those statements on their heads. God has turned the certainty of death from something to be feared and denied into the most hopeful and certain reality in this world. Truly on the cross, Jesus did die for another. He did experience death for another. That's his people. Furthermore, one of the most horrific instruments that mankind invented to terrify us of death, crucifixion. Oh, my friends, God has transformed that into something that is most beautiful. You're probably wearing it on in your jewelry right now. We make gold and diamond studded jewelry in the shape of a cross. We place a cross on the high. There they are right there on the lights. <laughs> you can see them right there. A cross right here at the center. Imagine if I were to put some kind of electric chair right here. That would be horrific to you. But not with the torture instrument of the cross. We put them on the stage and drape, drape them with purple sashes. Oh, friends, in God's love for us in Christ, stare, let your gaze be transfixed right here. Death has been beautified. 
Death has been beautified. Death has lost its sting. Now I can stare directly at death because I have a savior who hung upon the most cruel, torturous instrument of death. Jesus has beautified it for me. I can stare at death through Jesus. And when we see God's love for us in this way, oh, this beautiful love and mercy leads us to repentance. Happy Easter, my friends. Happy Easter. And this new mankind has a transformed way of life. What does it mean? Teaching them to observe my way of life. Here's what is possible, friends. That new way of life without fear. A new way of life without fear. Enjoying the good things of this world. A friendship, a good meal, a job well done, an encouraging word from somebody without clamoring for more as if this is all that there is. A life without the frenetic activity of trying to impress others or some afterlife deity. But instead, I'm free to love and free to rejoice in others who have better skills. Maybe they're more disciplined. Maybe they have more beautiful forms than me, more, more wealth than me. I can just rejoice with them without clamoring that I have to be better than them. Or a life like this, a life that is not enslaved to the fear of earthly hurts or insecurity, even for those for whom abuse and trauma has been a way of life for them most of their lives, because death now has been beautified. It is in, it's his people's ticket to be with Jesus. I can stare at death. I can gaze at death transfixed by Jesus' face that covers it for me. And I can say to die is gain. <laughs> in a way of life that displays the resurrection of hope in me so that I can share with others without fear to live as Christ. Finally, the Great Commission passage regarding the living Jesus signifies this. Oh, the promise of the presence of Jesus with his people always. Matthew started with a promise. Virgin will conceive and his name will be called Emmanuel, God with us. Matthew ends with this. I am with you to the end of the age. C. Everett Koop served as the 13th Surgeon General of the United States under President Ronald Reagan. He was at the memorial service for Joe Bailey's eldest son. He wrote this. The memorial service for Joe Bailey's eldest son was the most heart-wrenching yet triumphant hour that I can remember. The church was packed with Joe's friends and the friends his son had made at college. These young people felt inexplicably deprived of a truly unique person whose special view of life and of death they could not understand. Joe Bailey went to the front of the church. His opening words about his deceased son burned forever in my mind. I want to speak to you tonight about my earthly son and his heavenly father. Joe Bailey poured out his heart. Tears streamed down the faces of almost everyone present. And that night, the message Joe brought to his son's college friends started a large number of them down a path in search of what Joe and his son had. No fear of death. And many of them found faith in Jesus Christ. If you are here today, friend, and have not stared into the face of death, I'm asking you now to do so. But only because your face is transfixed on Jesus Christ right now, who made death beautiful. As one who has taken your eternal death for you, will you turn to him today in repentance so that you may be free from enslaving death, enslaving fear of death? Believers, the new man that Christ is creating in you, you recognize may be the only resurrected Savior that they see as you live out Christ. For me to live is Christ. Stare at him daily. And let his love transform you, living fearlessly now and proclaiming that hope to others. Faith Church family, he is risen. risen Let's pray. Oh, Father, this day, this celebration Sunday, will you help us to engage the evidence, resisting the temptation to deny and embrace how Christ has made death beautiful because of the hope of eternity with you. 
In Christ's name we pray, amen.